Well, good morning, everybody. Here's my plan for today's forecast video. I want to talk a bit about some of the strong winds we've seen lately, not only from Helene, but also from the event that came through the Pacific Northwest and then went through parts of the Northern Plains yesterday. I then want to cover the frost risk we've got. I want to talk about the drier conditions that most of the United States is going to be experiencing. We're going to dig a bit into the tropics, talk about the possibility of something coming back out of the Gulf of Mexico heading toward Florida. But then at the end, we're going to talk about what it would take to not have a dry October. And then we're going to look at South America and ask the same question, what would it take for the monsoon to start up? So we've got some interesting content, I think, today. The satellite animation goes right through sunrise early this morning as it was coming through uh, parts of the Midwest here. But I'm going to pause this for just a second and take you back to yesterday because we can see the cloud field left over from the combination of Helene and the upper level low continuing to spin, putting down some more precipitation in parts of the Mid-Atlantic, uh, getting into sections of the Northeast. But right here, we had a very dry front. So this front swept through, did very little to produce precipitation. Oop, got a new image in there. But on the back side of this, you can see some of the winds just blowing the smoke out of parts of uh, Wyoming, for example. It's getting caught up in that front as pretty well uh, defined here on satellite. I did want to zoom in and just have a look again yesterday uh, at the uh, wildfire smoke. So we can see it here pretty clearly. And just to make a comment, I didn't really say much about it yesterday, but there was a large dust storm uh, in the satellite imagery. If you go back and watch yesterday's video uh, here in the Columbia Basin. And uh, just to put, again, just a kind of a, a view of what these winds have been like from satellite here just over the last couple of days. So I made this graph. I, I need to make it, or this image, I need to make it a little bit better, overlay numbers, get it in my new projection system. But it's some code I wrote a long time ago. But what I did was I took the RTMA data set and then just looked back from the 25th of September to the 30th. And the map just shows maximum uh, wind gusts uh, that were observed hourly in this data set. So it's two and a half kilometer resolution, and uh, it's a great data set that the National Weather Service procures. And again, we can see if we look down here in the south uh, east, just to give you an idea, see the color bar down here for the wind speeds in mile per hour. We were able to carry hurricane force winds into South Carolina. And you can see how the stronger winds curled through parts of the Appalachian Mountains. They came up into parts of the Ohio Valley here with just take a look down here. Some of these gusts, you know, well above 45 to 50 miles an hour. And then if we kind of take a look at the northern plains and go back into Montana, then back into the Columbia Basin, you can start to see just how strong some of these winds have been as well. So we did have yesterday gusts that were in uh, the northern plains that were uh, up there in the 50 to 60 mile an hour range. And the front that was associated with this is continuing to advance forward. And by about 9 o'clock this morning, I just forwarded to this one or, or two or three hours. You can see where the frontal boundary will be here. And uh, so do you notice on the back side of it, we've got high pressure here. And that has quickly calmed things down. And as a result, we've got um, you know, some pretty rapid cooling this morning before the sun rises. And I was looking at the surface observations. You can see how weak the winds are in this area. A few places not even measuring winds. And the temperatures bottomed out very quickly. So I see a lot of you know, 36, 34. There's some 32s here in parts of Nebraska. Much higher elevation in this area. But that's where we've got some really cold air in place. Uh, 25 being reported here in parts of, of Wyoming. Um, but just take a look, a lot of areas here that are actually under a freeze warning this morning. You can't see it on my all hazards weather map because I prioritized the red flag warning over the freeze warning. So I overlay that color, but there's freeze warnings underneath all of this today. You can see them back here into parts of Idaho and Montana. And you can see the frost advisory that is out ahead of this here in this section of, uh, of North Dakota. Now we know that the temperatures are going to rebound very quickly in this area. We're going to talk about that in a few moments, but some dense fog in parts of the eastern Corn Belt down to the Mid-South, air quality issues down here farther into Texas. And in the Southwest, this is excessive heat uh, warnings, and these are excessive heat watch or uh, advisories that run up California's Central Valley. Okay, with that as a, as a start today, I just want to show you this, this front that's coming through. And so what you've got here on the high-res European model is the position of the front as viewed in dew points. We're just looking at moisture here. And this thing's really going to clear things out. I mean, it's going to bring, let's go right to, there's tomorrow morning. The frontal, frontal boundary, excuse me, makes it right about this point. And on the back side of this, we've got dew point temperatures in the plains and upper Midwest that are going to be in the low 20s. They're going to be back in the teens here in the, uh, you know, as farther you get, closer you get, excuse me, to the mountains. Now, this is the first of two fronts that are coming through. So let's play through Thursday into Friday. And as we work out there toward Saturday and Sunday, here's our next frontal boundary that's coming through. 
And as it rips through again, this one's going to be bringing in some cooler air. It's going to be bringing in much drier air. And this front's going to probably advance clear to the Gulf Coast. Look at that. So this is going to be a first taste of fall for some folks down here in the southeast in terms of just bringing in quite a bit of dry air behind this. And of course, that drier air will be welcomed as we continue to clean up uh, from Hurricane Helene. So I just wanted to show you just in the next two, uh, 10 days, excuse me, not even 10 days, next eight days, where we're anticipating um, these two fronts to come through and kind of their timing uh, as they deliver some dry fall air into places. Overall, though, I, I don't have much different from this. The, the narrative we, we established yesterday just continues. In fact, we've been talking about this, I feel like, for a couple of weeks. Lows are diving into the Gulf of Alaska. This ridge just wants to keep rebuilding. That's going to keep anything that develops tropically you know, away from coming into the southern plains and instead heading toward Florida. And then we have the Bermuda High here, which is sending systems into Europe where there's troughs in place, but parts of western Russia has more ridging. And it feels as though the pattern might be stuck in something like this for a while because this image is a 15-day average. So we're, I think we're really looking here at some blocked patterns across uh, the northern hemisphere just getting established in this particular kind of uh, route in terms of the jet stream pattern. And that's why over the next you know two weeks, most of the moisture from the Gulf of Alaska gets put into British Columbia. But with the ridge in place here, a lot of the United States, I mean, about three quarters of it may not measure precipitation at all in the next two weeks. We will be talking about the tropical system here in just a few moments. There is one system, I'll show you in a few moments, that might come over the top of this and dig deep into parts of the Northeast. I'll show you the timing on that in a few moments based on the European model but very, very dry weather. And that's why we're going to ask a question here in a few minutes. What does this pattern need to look like? You know, what, what, what needs to change here in order for us to get into a wetter pattern at some point in October so that you'll know what I'm looking for in this forecast? But again, that's the two-week average precipitation anomaly. And we've discussed how dry things are in this area. So this is just beginning to rapidly develop drought in, in, in this fall. Now, in the tropics, we have still got a 40% chance of development from the National Hurricane Center on this tropical, it's not even a wave, this, this area of convection that's down here in the Caribbean toward the Yucatan. But because the Bermuda High is positioned over here, we just keep sending these named systems, like we have Joyce and Kirk, and Kirk it up there to Cat 3, but the flow is just going around the Bermuda High, which is tucked way over there on the African side of the Atlantic Ocean. You do note that over the next 10 days, the European model is giving a 90% chance of developing a tropical depression. So let's be clear here. This is the development of a tropical depression off of the northern side of the Yucatan into the Gulf of Mexico. If you look at the chance of developing a tropical storm in the next 10 days, it's around 50% in this area. So in other words, getting a named system, we got about a 50% chance. But as you can see from the forecast tracks from the European model, seems as though whatever develops there is deflected to the south by the much higher pressure that's going to be over parts of the Midwest, Mid-South, and possibly take its moisture into Florida. While Joyce, most people Joyce, of course, but also uh, Kirk, curls around um, the Bermuda High, again, which is tucked over on the far eastern side of, of the Atlantic Ocean. So again, let's just keep our eyes down here. I don't have much confidence that we're looking at a big system. I know there's been a lot of hype about this on the internet. I mean, my goodness, I... I wish I could just kind of clean out some of that stuff that you see on Facebook and other social media platforms of people that just post these ridiculous things about what could be coming out of here. But we just need to understand there's about a 50% chance that we develop another named system, but it's all going to be in its path. And I think at this point, should something develop, the most likely course that it would follow, as you see here, would be toward Florida. So we are going to look closely at those precipitation totals in Florida. So I wanted to bring up... Um, you know, five models. We have the European high res, the artificial intelligence. This is the GFS, the WPC, and the national blend of models. And uh, let's just take a closer look at this image here um, because this is the WPC uh, seven day forecast. And as you note, along the Gulf Coast and into Florida, we do have this risk of, of heavy rainfall. I'm going to show you the European in a few moments as well. But over the next seven days, there's a lot of zeros because the flow is coming into British Columbia. There is one system that could come into the kind of Canadian Maritimes and maybe spin up here, uh, but it's it's several days away from where that, would, that one would be coming in. So this is your look at the next seven days overall. Now to show you the timing of that system, so let's get this to this morning, there we go. 
you know, you, we're looking out here and we're seeing just some remnant moisture from um, the, the, the system, uh, the, the combination of Helene and, and, and the upper level low high pressure behind this. As we just play this forward, let's get a refresh on that. I'm sorry. There we go. As we play this forward and that just leaves, the front clears it out and there's just not much in the way of precip. I, mean, I know you see some some green in here. Uh, this would be Thursday afternoon and evening, but I'm not even anticipating much moisture out of this. So we play it on forward, and this is the system I'm going to keep an eye on. It's Saturday. It's coming through parts of the Canadian Prairie, over toward parts of um, you know Manitoba and Ontario. It would be cold enough on the backside for some snow. The flow just continuing to batter the coast of um, you know British Columbia. But at this point, this will be you know early in the morning on Sunday. There could be something here to be talking about, and we have a larger low here. So as we go forward from Sunday into Monday, it looks as though late this weekend and early next week, that low drops a front that comes into this area, and we can see the moisture from this would-be tropical system coming toward Florida. And what you'll notice is, we just go back and forth, Monday into Tuesday, you can see that around the large ridge, we're starting to get a little curl up here, a low that I kept calling it a reflection low because you have the deeper one over here, ridge in the middle, deeper low might try to form at some point in the northeast. Again, this is next Monday into Tuesday that we're talking about here as we watch this system go through Florida. But I just played you out 10 days and you didn't see much of anything going through the midsection of the country. And that's why the 10 day forecast from the European model looks something like this. So this is just taking raw model data, uh, again, straight from the European Center, and we're just projecting it out over the next 10 days. And so that system coming through late, late in the time period, this is next week, early next week, maybe there's some heavy rain in it, but be aware that the position of that low is going to change, so will its strength, and the same thing will happen here as well. I'm not, you know, you look at this and you see huge rainfall totals, and that is possible. But um, we'll watch it very carefully to see what develops in this area, if anything develops in this area. So from there, let's talk about uh, the wind field with this. Let's get a refresh on this. So we can see our frontal boundary sweeping through. And then you know the next one's coming through at the end of this week, into the weekend. So already, this is Friday into Saturday. See the strong winds coming back into the plains and prairie. There it is, Friday to Saturday. I'm kind of rocking back and forth. And if I take it out a full 10 days, we could have some stronger winds with the potential of this tropical system. There's very strong winds in the Canadian Prairie after coming over the Cascades and the Rockies. Maybe some stronger winds in the upper Midwest. And then as that low forms next week, early next week, right in through this area, just take note of the stronger winds that we could be experiencing offshore. So just kind of wanted to review that with you before we look out there into week two's precipitation patterns. Overall, you can see the model stretched across the top there. Again, this is at agweather, ag-wx.com. You notice that we've got, you know, just dry in all cases. And the reason why the artificial intelligence is showing much wetter into the southeast is because, I'm just going to show you this because we have just a moment here. I'm going to go over to regional forecast, click on CONUS. I will be uploading other ones soon. But this is the artificial intelligence forecast, okay, of precipitation type and intensity. And what you get here is there's the first system. That's the one early next week. And then the AI has just got another pulse of tropical moisture trying to come into this area. But it's out there what, day 13. Uh, this is or day 12. October um, 12th is when it's got that coming through. So we just need to be aware that that's why the model looks so wet out when you look out there at week two. Sorry. And um, it's an outlier. So I just, I just want to make, make a point about that. Now, with dry air coming in behind these fronts, we have to discuss what's going on with frost. And here's our newest frost map for the next seven days. So I think this was pretty well anticipated uh, in the forecast models. We, you know, we talked about that front, the two fronts coming through and what they could do. But let's get a look at low temperatures. So this was this morning's low temperatures. We then get into tomorrow morning. Look at this, a widespread area of 30s here getting into the 40s that stretch all the way down into you know, Oklahoma and Texas. And that's cool, but mentioned the flip-flop in the temperatures. Look at this quick rebound as the flow comes off of the mountains in the west. You get a little bit of um, adiabatic warming there. Then here's the next front, Friday, sweeping through by Saturday, dropping these temperatures off again. And then we get into Sunday and Monday. So what's amazing about this, just so we're clear, this is Monday morning's lows, and you see a lot of 40s and 50s in here. 
that for the 7th of October is technically, you know, three or four degrees above average. So this is still a very mild forecast overall, and the shots of colder air are, are relatively brief. So here's today's highs getting into tomorrow. So I'll actually be up in Fargo tomorrow. Uh, it'll be just about as warm as it is for home for me in Champaign where the front clears. But in between, look at these temperatures. And the West Coast, which has out for California down into the Southwest, the excessive heat watches, warnings, and advisories. You know, we're back up in the triple digits here in the uh, Central Valley. So this is Thursday into Friday. Next front coming through here, Friday into Saturday. And then another major warm-up. So I just showed you we have temperatures here that are 32 now. Uh, and then twice this week, we're expecting the temperatures to climb way back up. And by Saturday, we're in the 90s in this part of Nebraska. And I know those of you that are here, you know this. Like this isn't anything strange, but we can get these wild temperature fluctuations in this area this time of year. So beyond that, take note of the pattern. I, I just think we are here for a while. This is day five through 10. Lows go to here, run over the ridge. You get lows that form there, but that, that's it. And as far as I can see in October, I see something like this. And so does the Climate Prediction Center. At the end of the day yesterday, they released their final update for the month. They always do it at the middle of the month and at the end of the month. And this is their um, official October forecast. <clears throat> and they are calling for that pattern that we are in to just get stuck, right? It looks very, very similar to what I just showed you the next two weeks are going to be. So it's a pretty good call on their part just to say, I, I don't think this is going to go much of anywhere, uh, given that we're so blocked up in the pattern <clears throat> coming out of uh, the Bering, Bering Sea into uh, Gulf of Alaska. No change at all in the European model. Looked very, very dry. So I thought of, of just thinking about all of this this morning and recognizing that over the last 30 days, you know, if we wouldn't have had, you know, Helene come through and would not have had... Um, uh, Francine come through, none of this would, would be wet either. There'd be a large area of the country that would be extremely dry and it would extend from the plains and Midwest and Mid-South and Southeast clear into parts of the, of the, uh, you know, of the, the Northeast. This would all be very, very dry. And so just thinking about this large region, I went in and I created a map. Where's that map? Oh, maybe I have to display it. Let's redraw the map. There we go. I said for that big area, Let's create a time series of total precipitation for October. And that's what you've got here. So this is just going back to 1940 and looking to last year, what October precipitation looked like. So I wanna know what it's gonna to take to break this all down and get a wet October, right? Cause you know we have a dry one forecast. So here's what you gotta be on the lookout for. It's this, when you put all those years together, instead of having deep lows that form here, and get to this point and then run over a ridge, flip the whole thing around. We've got to have ridging of high pressure here and here. See how that one reflects it? So the flow comes over the top, dives into the southwest and rolls out. And that is what opens up the Gulf of Mexico, produces low pressure off of the Rocky Mountains. And we get into one of those Octobers that it ends up snowing on, a, you know, on Halloween. And we just don't have this. We have the exact opposite of this pattern. So what you need is you need about a 90 degree in, lati in longitude, excuse me, a 90 degree in longitude phase shift in the whole pattern in order to take the lows that keep forming here and here and shove them to the, I don't care, east or west, the whole thing has to break down. And I was thinking about it, what are the ocean temperatures typically look like or the skin temperature of the earth typically look like? And during those years that it's wet, it's much cooler in the west, very hot in the southeast. And we tend to have El Nino-like behavior. And we currently don't have that, as you know very well. We're building in, you know, this La Nina in place. And then take a look at this. You'd have to have some cooler water here. And we have got nothing of that. So this is why I've been going on and on about what this pattern does. It's the fact that there's higher pressure here, lower pressure there, and that is what defines the positive phase of the West Pacific Oscillation. It's actually a part of several you know, North Pacific um, oscillations we keep track of. But the WPO was just, I think, the easiest one for, for us to just use as an example. So we, we just don't have the right situation in the atmosphere to drive a, a change in the pattern. So we, we look at the October forecast and understand why it looks the way it does. 
So from here, let's apply the same logic to South America. Now we've looked at this. Do you remember when I talked a few weeks ago about how, maybe it was about a month ago, we talked about there's this longer term downward trend in uh, Brazil. Do I have the map? Let's redraw it real quick. There we go. In this area in Brazil, which is called kind of the center west region, where they've been getting drier Octobers for a while, since really since the 70s and 80s. It's off by about 80 millimeters uh, in total. And that's been the decrease. So if we if we look at this and we pluck off these wetter years and just make a make a graph of those, here's one thing that definitely happens. In fact, I think I okay. So here's the, here's the thing that typically happens. We're going to look at precipitable water. In September and early October, in order for the monsoon to start early, you need to have a surplus of moisture in the atmosphere already entering Brazil's northeast. Okay? That's what you got to have. And we've not had that. Now, I apologize. I can't reverse the color bar on this tool, but the blues are a deficit. So if this was all these bright, warm colors, the monsoon would have already started. We would have gone mad. But we've not. We've had this dry area in through here that is yet to be overcome. You say, well, what does it mean? Well, remember, what typically happens here is high pressure starts to build here more often, and the flow comes around, <clears throat> comes up into the tropics, and it drives that flow into this area. If you have a deficit in moisture here, there's going to be a, it's going to zap the moisture out of the flow coming off the Atlantic and kill the monsoon. And that's been, that's been the problem we've been having. Now, those same years, sorry for this, this map is a little kind of ugly here, but skin temperature, warmer than average, cooler than average. Those same years, we tend to be cool in the month of October, and the waters off of the coast tend to be warm. Now, this is only ocean temperature, but we don't have that. So it's just a, a few different pieces of this puzzle, but I think the biggest issue right now with the Brazilian monsoon is that we just don't have the moisture in place, and if it arrives, then there is something serious that we need to talk about. Now, I mean, I mean the arrival of the monsoon. So here's what I'm looking at. Uh, over the next uh, four or five days, do you see the deficit in precipitable water? There it is. That's the area that's kind of just stealing the moisture and not letting it get farther to the, uh, to the west. But by the time you get out there about a week from now, things start to try to fill in. And 10 days from now, precipitable water map shows it filling in. And I'm bringing this up because the 10-day forecast from the European has showed that we're trying to bring in some of those early showers for the monsoon in the first 10 days of October. This is not full monsoonal arrival because when it gets going, we're talking about widespread 50 millimeters of rainfall in this area over a two-week time period. But it's the beginning and I think it's one of the reasons why the European model continues to show up wetter for the month of October, which is what you've got here. I do think it's important to show you other models. I, I, I've been going with the European because we've been watching it oscillate back and forth. But let's go look at the GFS extended. So the GFS extended, its forecast for October has just gotten nothing. It's very, very, very dry. But I, I don't tend to use this model when I look at South American precipitation and I think I just I have yet to see a lot of consistent behavior in it. So I tend to just not look at it, which is why I'm just going to come back and show you again. If we go back to the weeklies, I think we've got better chances of bringing in some monsoonal moisture at times over the next um, 10 days and then really get the monsoon going later in the month. If I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, what I will what I'll be wrong about is this area. Whoops, I want to show you this map. It's this area filling in with moisture. If that doesn't happen, then everything I just shared with you is, is wrong. This will not start to make rain in this area, and this forecast will bust. So I think it is all about overcoming the deficit, replacing it with much more humid air to enhance the monsoonal flow, which again tries to come in in several different directions, but it's, it's all coming off the Atlantic into this area. So that's what I think we need to see here. And by the way, you note that years where the monsoon gets going early, we tend to be drier farther to the south. And we are definitely not drier far to the south right now, which is why this monsoon, I think, is a bit delayed. So too many things are kind of um, deconstructively <laughs> adding together to, to prevent the early onset of the monsoon. But at some point in mid-October, I think it's going to get going. 
So that's what I wanted to share with you today. I'll keep monitoring things and uh, we'll talk again tomorrow morning. I, I'll be in Fargo. In the event that I don't have uh, internet access when I get up there, I'm a bit concerned about it. Um, my, my colleague, Matt Reardon, might fill in for me tomorrow. So just in case you hear a different voice in the morning, it'll be Matt. But uh, I appreciate you guys uh, being flexible. So we'll talk soon. Thanks.